Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to day two of Delusion Qatari Studies, India Collective's fifth international conference. I welcome you all to plenary session four. Our esteemed chair for the session is Dr. Meena Gupta. Dr. Meena Gupta is an associate professor in the Department of English and Cultural Studies at Punjab University, Chandigarh, India. She is also the vice president of Deleuze and Qatari Studies India Collective. She has authored three books, and her forthcoming publication is titled "Mapping the Ethical Turn Through the Indian Game." Her research interests include areas of literary theory, Salman Rushdie, and comparison between French philosopher Deleuze and Indian philosophy. She has successfully supervised and mentored a number of PhD and MP research scholars, and has been invited to present research papers at various conferences, both in India and abroad. She also runs English proficiency courses from time to time. Now I request Dr. Meena Gupta to take over the session. Thank you. Thank you, Aditi. Thank you. So welcome, Professor Jeffrey Bell. It's a privilege to host you for our plenary session. four of the conference and first plenary of the day personally i am indebted to you because i heard you uh, you are speaking at manipal and that actually you know uh, uh, you know uh, caught me caught my attention exploring indian philosophy well i mean in 2015 neither i was delusion scholar nor i was a scholar of indian philosophy but that you know put me into looking for delusion concerns in indian philosophy so thank you for joining us uh, today for the plenary now thank i'll form much. yeah i'll formally introduce you professor jeffrey bell is a professor of philosophy at south eastern louisiana university he specializes in european philosophy since kant deleuze hume spinoza intellectual history political theory aesthetics and has authored the following books Deleuze, Hume, Philosophy, Culture, and the Scottish Enlightenment, published by Edinburgh University Press. Philosophy at the Age of Chaos, Giles Deleuze and the Philosophy of Difference. The Problem of Difference, Phenomenology, and Poststructuralism. He is currently at work on two book-length projects. One is tentatively titled Spinoza and the Problem of History, and the other is tentatively titled. conceptual nomadism and intellectual history of philosophy since kant in the first book he offers a reading of spinoza that argues that spinoza's corpus is best understood in terms of the conceptual resources spinoza developed as he simultaneously addressed issues in the history of philosophy in his work on descartes and the attendant problem of history that accompanies such a task this reading allows us both to understand and supplement deleuze Girault uh, inspired reading of Spinoza and it more generally makes a case for the importance of the history of philosophy to doing philosophy. The second book is in many ways a companion piece to the first in that it is a history of philosophy that sets forth a philosophy of concepts and in the end will show what it means for philosophy to be the intellectual labor of creating concepts. Thank you Professor Bell for joining and over to you please. Thank you. Um, I will have to update my website, but the, you're, you're right. I do have two books coming out, but they ended up after I wrote them to be very different from my initial plan. I think it happens to us when we actually sit down and and start writing. Um, what I'm talking about today is from sort of the second volume of, of the two volume. The first volume book I have is on um, uh, truth and relevance. It's on metaphysics and. Uh, develops a theory of problems where i look at analytic and continental philosophy the second volume is called a toward a critical existentialism and i develop sort of a delusion theory and and a political theory in that light so what i'm presenting today is sort of from that second volume which will be coming out in with edinburgh press early next year so it it's in three parts uh the first part i kind of lay out deleuze's hume humean problematic In the second part, I look at Pierre Bourdieu as a way of kind of helping to clarify what's going on with Deleuze. And in the third part, I develop more of the political theory based upon what I do in the first two parts. The third part's the longer of the of the three parts. And then hopefully we'll have some time for questions. And if we don't have enough time for questions, please feel free to email me or contact me uh, that way, and I'll be more than happy to 
continue the conversation that way. Unfortunately, we can't be together and continue it over lunch or drinks or anything like that, but I see some familiar names who I've had drinks with before, so I look forward to doing that again in the future. So I'll get started right away uh, with the first part. As Deleuze says on numerous occasions, philosophers have never been truly motivated by the what is X question. Rather, Deleuze argues, questions such as who, how much, how, where, when, are better questions. Questions that are integral to the process of encountering a problem. A problem that then prompts and shocks us into the effort of making sense. To expand upon what I mean here, making sense, let us take the case of the jealous lover, as Deleuze does as well in his book on Proust. Proust was well aware of the pressing questions just mentioned, and the jealous narrator of the prisoner admits that the questions his jealousy provoked always made him more open to the world of the possible than to that of real life contingencies. He then goes on to admit that he would be well served if he could find within himself a prefect of police who reasons logically and in accordance with the probabilities of one's given situation. Such is not the case, however, for one who is jealous. For rather than confine themselves to the probability and logic of one's situation, they continually go beyond what is given and wander to all the possibilities between here and the four corners of the universe. That was Proust. Reality, our jealous neighbor admits, is always a mere starting point towards the unknown on a path down which we can never travel very far. It is better not to know, to think as little as possible, to not jealousy on the smallest concrete detail. Permanent detail will simply feed and amplify the jealous questioning, the effort of the jealous person to come to terms with the reality that makes sense of their jealousy. Even if the jealous lover were given a determinate indisputable fact, let us say proof that their partner had indeed cheated with a particular person, then this will only intensify the questioning. How did this occur? Where, when, and who else is there? If there was this person, might there be others? And who, when, and in what circumstances did these occur? And so on. With these questions, the jealous person encounters the problematic reality that makes sense of their jealousy, but at the cost of delirium of ceaseless questions. Louis Bunuel, famous uh, director, has a great movie called Elle, or Him, which tracks the sort of decline of a jealous husband. He just gets married and his jealousy, he eventually slips into madness and complete delusion as a result of his jealousy. So he, these types of questions kind of undermine is what we would normally take the probabilities of everyday life, what we would normally think would make sense of our life. Um, it doesn't work for him. We find in Hume a similar awareness of our tendency to move beyond what is given to the four corners of the universe, to follow the imagination to an infinity of possibilities. This is where delirium enters the scene for Hume. This occurs in relation to Hume's principles of association, principles which naturally lead us to connect one impression with another. Namely, these are the principles of resemblance, contiguity, and causation. So that's Hume 101. Over time and through repetition, these principles solidify into habit and custom. The result being that we have a more lively expectation and association between some ideas and others. The idea of a mountain and being covered with snow will have more numerous associations and hence result in a more strongly held belief about reality than the idea of a mountain and being made of gold. And thus will affect in turn what we take more likely to be true or false about reality. In cases of delirium and madness, however, Hume argues, customary associations become irrelevant. As Hume puts it, for one in delirium, quote, every chimera of the brain is as vivid and intense as any of those inferences we formerly dignified with the name of conclusion concerning matters of fact, and sometimes as the present impression of the senses, end quote. In other words, for one who is mad, a single encounter may give rise to an idea that has force and vivacity one would ordinarily find only after the series of repetitions give rise to a customary transition and expectation. 
So in the film, Boon, uh, the Boonwell film, for instance, there's a scene where the husband and wife, recently married, go to a hotel and the wife sees a, a colleague that she knows from work and the husband immediately leaps to the inference that he's stalking them and that they used to have a relationship. It's not true, but he immediately leaps to that inference. So it's an example of how the sort of jealousy undermines the normal associative patterns that, that Hume would talk about. And Hume's aware of the similar possibility as well. So if we think of the delirium and madness, which might befall a jealous lover, for instance, their qu questioning may lead them to conclusions that are far beyond being matters of fact. Facts justified by the probabilities that come with the principles of association. The probabilities that would be the basis for how Proust's prefect of police would think. As Hume puts it, the delusional beliefs of the jealous lover can come to have the same status as those we formerly dignified with the name of conclusion concerning matters of fact. They'll be just as convinced that their QAnon belief is as valid and legitimate as the sun will rise tomorrow, something like that. Thus, although our thinking usually follows the tried and tested patterns laid down by the principles of association and the customs and habit built upon their repetitive application, there is no guarantee that this will occur. And the infinite play of imagination and the threat of delirium is an ever present risk associated with thinking. This is the problem Hume leaves us with, or it is what one might call the problem of Hume. It is the inseparability of delirium from thinking that will be a primary focus of Deleuze's interest in Hume. Of particular importance for Deleuze will be passages such as the following, where Hume acknowledges, quote, the liberty of the imagination to transpose and change its ideas, to which Hume adds, the fables we meet with in poems and romances put this entirely out of question. Nature there is totally confounded and nothing mentioned but winged horses, fiery dragons and monstrous giants, end quote. In other words, we only need to open a poem, romance or a Harry Potter book to realize the liberty with which the imagination can combine and change its ideas. As Deleuze takes up this passage, he sees the starting point for Hume's project as being one where, quote, left to itself, the mind has the capacity to move from one idea to another, but it does so at random in a delirium that runs throughout the universe, creating fire dragons, winged horses, and monstrous giants. So he's kind of combining both Proust and Hume's quote in that one uh, point about delirium, Deleuze's. As Deleuze reads Hume, this delirium comes to be tamed or is drawn into habitual patterns by way of the principles of association. As Deleuze states this point, quote, the principles of human nature impose constant rules on this delirium, laws of passage, of transition, of inference, which are in accordance with nature itself, end quote. The important point to draw from Hume, as well as Proust and Boonwell, I would argue, is that making sense of a situation involves a thinking that is inseparably related to a delirium that may well undermine the very task that think thinking sets out to do. To state this point differently, if thinking entails thinking determinate thoughts, thoughts with some determinate representational or propositional content, then this thinking also involves a problematic tendency which may well undermine the tendency to determinate thoughts and hence, and hence undermine thinking itself. So that's kind of set up the sort of Humean problematic that I think Deleuze is taking up. So that's the, the end of part one. So now on to we can further clarify Deleuze's understanding of the nature of problems by turning to Pierre Bourdieu's work. In particular, Bourdieu uses the concept field in a way that is similar to Deleuze. Deleuze begins his final essay, Imminence, A Life, for instance, with the question, what is a transcendental field? As Bourdieu understands the concept field, it is similar to, but importantly different from, the understanding of fields among physicists. The similarity seems clear. In stating the consensus of physicists, Steven Weinberg claims that, quote, material particles such as photons were reduced in status to mere epiphenomena or of, for example, electromagnetic fields. Similarly, one could argue that the agency of individuals should be understood to be mere epiphenomena of various social fields. 
such as kinship structures, etc. This is the structuralist understanding of agency. And Bourdieu pushes back against it. For Bourdieu, by contrast, he wants to inter quote, introduce the agents or reintroduce the agents that Levi Strauss and the structuralists, among others Althusser, tended to abolish, making them into simple epiphenomena of structures, end quote. Social agents, Bourdieu adds, in archaic societies as well as in ours, are not automata regulated like clocks in accordance with laws or structures which they do not understand, end quote. For this, Bourdieu adds the concept of habitus to the concept of field, and he does so in order to avoid falling back into a structuralist determinism on the one hand and a conscious voluntarism or phenomenology on the other. So I think that really at, at the core is the, the essence of Bourdieu's project. Bourdieu believes his account of the relation of habitus and field supplies us with the only rigorous way of reintroducing agents and their individual actions without falling back into the amorphous anecdotes of factual history. In other words, the habitus of an individual is neither an epiphenomena of social structures, nor is it reducible to being a phenomenological aspect of subjective experience. Rather, it is what Bourdieu describes as a feel for the game, whereby an agent's actions are immediately adjusted to the imminent demands of the game. So you either get it or you don't, right? But it's not predetermined by a structure that you get it. Uh, but getting it isn't a conscious phenomenological experience either. So habitus is this sort of feel for the game. Um, so it's an agent's actions, if they have that feel for the game, are immediately adjusted to the imminent demands of the game, where their behavior is directed towards certain ends without being consciously directed to these ends or determined by them. It is habitus that accounts for an agent whose feel for the game results in actions that are both irreducible to the social field in which they occur and all the determinate historical facts, rules, and laws of this field, and they are irreducible to the conscious awareness of why we are doing what we are doing when acting. So it's not naturalism nor phenomenology. Let us now turn to the nature of problems or problematic fields to connect Bourdieu's work with Deleuze's. As with the understanding of fields in physics, a problematic field, which is a concept that I'm introducing here, kind of developing Deleuze's own work, a problematic field is understood to be the condition for the possibility of the determinate, individuated entities that are manifestations or epiphenomena of their fields. Bourdieu adopts this understanding of field and echoes the physicist when he claims that, quote, the individual, like the electron, is an emanation of the field. In particular, what makes fields possible for Bourdieu, quote, is a species of capital, such as the knowledge of Greek or of integral calculus, end quote, which constitutes a form of social capital. The knowledge of Greek, for instance, may place one in an advantageous social position vis-a-vis -vis others who lack this knowledge or social capital. A field is thus, as Bourdieu defines it, a network or a configuration of objective relations between positions, those who do and do not have Greek. And, and Bourdieu's book, Distinction, is filled with all sorts of sort of like extensive studies about people who drink wine have faster tendencies to promotion versus people who have beer and all these various other because of the sort of the social capital that comes with all these objective relations as, as Bourdieu understands it. This is where the difference between Bourdieu's understanding of field and that found in physics emerges. In short, for Bourdieu, the objective relations between positions is something that is itself contested by the various social agents who bear the various species of capital made possible by fields. Fields thus have a history, a history of contestations, where the regularities and the rules constitutive of this space of play can become transformed such that, for instance, Knowing Greek no longer affords the social capital it once did. It has a history, it's been challenged over time and now it's no longer has the social capital it once did. There are times, however, and as Bourdieu notes, when attempts are made to solidify the relations of the social field. This occurs, Bourdieu claims, in certain pathological states of fields, such as total institutions, asylums, prisons, concentration camps, or dictatorial states, 
where there are attempts to institute an end to history. That was Bourdieu. Or there is an attempt to create fields that are immune to contested, immune to historical transformation. For reasons that will become clear in a moment, problematic fields are by their nature resistant to such pathological states, for they are the condition for the emergence of the determinate relations that total institutions attempt to freeze into place. And moreover, problematic fields are not to be confused with entities and determinate states that they make possible. So we can now begin to see how problematic fields as Deleuze or in a Deleuzean understanding differs from Bourdieu's use of the concept field. For Bourdieu, a field is a network or a configuration of objective relations between positions. You can objectively empirically chart them out as Bourdieu does in that book Distinction. A problematic field by contrast is not a network or configuration of objective relations between positions but is instead a network or configuration of becomings or of processes of making sense. The difference here is subtle but significant. First, integral to a process of making sense is the tendency toward Humean delirium that I talked about in the first part, toward the delirium that undermines that which makes sense. And second, there is the tendency toward the determinate, toward further determining and differentiating that which is determining who, when, where, how many. That is the determinate content of that which makes sense. Making sense, however, is neither delirium nor determinate. It's the tendencies to both directions. Rather, it is a problematic field, a process. Moreover, although a problematic field is the condition for the determinate, which arise as solutions, Problematic fields are not exhausted by these solutions and are thus not to be confused with them. At the same time, however, problematic fields are not independent of the solutions they make possible, for they are only discernible with their determinate solutions. A problematic field, in short, is what is presupposed when a determinate entity comes to be or when it becomes something other. And this involves an incorporeal transformation or multiplicity of such transformations, for it is irreducible to any determinate corporal entity. Determinate corporal entities are epiphenomena of problematic fields or emanations of fields as Bourdieu puts it. It is here, however, where the difference with Bourdieu lies. For a problematic field is not to be understood as a configuration or network of objective relations between positions. With these positions taken to be determinate, individuated positions that are actual positions within a given field, positions that are contested and have a history. That is Bourdieu's position, but that is not what Deleuze, or I would claim Deleuze would argue. For, uh, at this point, my Deleuzean understanding of fields is closer to the view found in physics, where fields are what make actual material particles such as electrons possible. Although these fields are real, and inseparable from the particles that emanate from them, they are not composed of actual particles, nor are they to be confused with actual particles, but instead they consist of virtual particles, which is an actual word the physicists use, virtual particles, such as virtual photons. We can thus see why Deleuze will use the term virtual when discussing that which makes determinate actual entities possible. As Deleuze will say on a number of occasions, the virtual is real, but not actual. For us as well, a problematic field is a network and configuration of incorporeal transformations, or it is a virtual field that is real and not to be confused with a set of actual positions, nor the objective relations between actual positions that form the basis of Bourdieu's understanding of fields. So after having kind of clarified the problematic fields as I think Deleuze is developing them in contrast to the notion of fields that Bourdieu develops, I'm moving on now to the third section. So where I turn now to the more political theory as a sort of an extended example to clarify the more theoretical stuff of the first two parts. So now I get into more concrete issues. So hopefully this will be, be clearer. We can now turn in this final section to some arguments concerning the nature of capitalism and markets to clarify the Deleuzean arguments regarding problematic fields. On the one hand, it may appear that the notion of a problematic field would be very much amenable to embracing laissez-faire capitalism. Friedrich Hayek, for instance, 
has famously argued that market forces are much more adept and able to respond to changing circumstances than politicians, whose efforts are more likely than not to create more problems than those they intend to solve. Market processes thus give rise to determinate relations and distributions of resources, but are not to be reduced to these relations. And any attempt to predetermine market processes in accordance with the political agenda, or any attempt to model in advance the determinate ways in which the market should or will proceed, will end up making matters worse. So standard sort of neoliberal uh, Hayekian argument. The spectacular failure of the Black-Scholes equation to determine the market prices of derivatives and um, the role this failure played in the subsequent financial crisis of 2007 is a notable example in support of Hayek's caution. If one finds problematic fields, which are likewise not to be confused with the determinate actualities they make possible, to be functionally equivalent to market processes in Hayek's sense, then one would be inclined to claim, as Luke Boltansky and Yves Schiappello do in The New Spirit of Capitalism, that Deleuze's thought offers, contrary to his own intentions, a defense of neoliberal capitalism. So there are people who make these arguments out there. There is a key difference, however, um, between problematic fields and market processes as Hayek understands them. Namely, for Hayek, markets operate according to mechanisms that are impersonal, meaning they are not to be confused with the determinate will or wills of individuals and groups. If I lose my job due to redundancy, or if I become impoverished due to excessive medical costs, no blame is to be cast, according to Hayek, as long as these consequences are the effect of impersonal economic processes, where the damaging effects of such processes are, to quote Hayek, not different from that of any natural calamity, a fire or a flood that destroys my house, or an accident that harms my health. Hayek's move, however, presupposes that we can determinately separate the impersonal from the personal, or relatedly, that economic processes are to be contained in their own politics-free zone, independent of the determinate actions, desires, and agendas of the individuals who are subject to the effects of these economic processes. So unsurprisingly, I will claim that that can't be done. It is here where a classical Republican critique of capitalism could be made. And it is just such a critique I find implicit in a number of the existential writers, such as Nietzsche, Sartre, but also Deleuze, admittedly not an existentialist, one can also find the classical Republican critique of capitalism in Marx, as William Clare Roberts has argued for in his book, Marx's Inferno. To state the argument, the idea of classical Republicanism was to eliminate arbitrary power. For arbitrary power, as Roberts notes, quote, has a tendency to corrupt the character of the subjected because the practice of virtue entails a more or less predictable alignment between um, between being good and doing good, between the actions that will perfect one as a person and those that will achieve one's ends. This alignment is disrupted if the achievement of one's ends is dependent upon the caprice of someone with the power to interfere in one's life will, end quote. With the rise of capitalism and the process of primitive accumulation inseparable from it, increasing numbers of people have become compelled and forced to enter the market in order to attain the very conditions of their subsistence. Upon entering the market, however, one becomes subjected to economic processes that disrupt the ability to achieve one's ends, or there is no way, Roberts goes on to claim, to ensure that one's labor power or one's commodity in general is marketable. That is precisely the problem. In other words, by being forced to market oneself, to place one's labor power or one's commodity in general onto the market, for example, by placing one's skills and expertise in philosophy on the academic job market, one's prospects at making a living are subject, are subject to impersonal market forces, which are often hard to determine, if not outright arbitrary. The life-changing effects that may result if one fails to get a job and the ensuing poverty, depression, etc., that may result is not, however, to be chalked up, according to Hayek, to anything that one may seek to change through political intervention but is rather to be seen in the manner of a natural calamity. And thus there is nobody to blame for the consequences that befall us. Stated as classical Republicans would understand this, the result is clear. One is not free under capitalism. As Robert states it, commercial society leaves us unfree because it renders us systematically irresponsible 
for our economic life. We are no longer responsible for the conditions of our life activity, for it is not us, but impersonal market forces that deliver the conditions of our life activity. As a result of capitalism and its process of primitive accumulation, our life activity and labor has been divorced from the very conditions of this activity. The continuing effects of primitive accumulation and its forcing of people into a market over which they have no control and ought not to control according to Hayek, and yet nonetheless unleashes its dominating controlling effects upon them. In her capitalism, Ellen Wood, and it's a great book, uh, strikes a similar chord to Roberts. Rather than being the vehicle of our freedom, Wood's main argument is that there are specific ways in which the market operates in capitalism. It's specific laws of motion that uniquely compel people to enter the market, to reinvest surpluses, and to produce efficiently by improving labor productivity, the law of profit maximization, and capital accumulation. These laws on Wood's account, or what she calls the capitalist laws of motion, are solutions to specific socioeconomic problems in agricultural England around the turn of the 16th century. As these solutions come to be seen as laws, they become, to state this in my terms, to be seen as solutions without a problem, a determinate inexorable process that predetermines in advance how things should go. This is not how problematic fields are to be understood. As I have been arguing, problems are inseparable from their solutions. There are no solutions without a problem. And as such, determinate solutions are always solutions inseparable from a problem. And through historical inquiry and analysis, we may problematize these solutions or challenge narratives, beliefs, and practices which serve to hide or mask the problematic nature of things. In the case of capitalist society, for instance, one way to problematize practices and beliefs is to ask whether we are being forced, compelled, and dom whether we're confusing being forced, compelled, and dominated with being free. When one questions or problematizes the liberty that has come to be identified with the processes of capitalist markets, then perhaps the problematic nature that has not been exhausted by the solutions we live each day may well create possibilities for transformations, for an undermining of the capitalist laws of motion. One need not begin this process of questioning with grand institutional and economic structures, however. One can and should begin where one is, with the simplest of interactions, and through a process of critical analysis, problematize one's relations to self, others, and the world. This is the approach I claim Deleuze and Hume have tasked us with undertaking. If our inquiries and critical analysis are to have, as Hume argues, a direct reference to action and society, then we should begin with expectations and habits that are ready to hand and inquire into the nature and conditions of these beliefs and behaviors habits and expectations. Are they legitimate or illegitimate, justified or arbitrary? In a similar manner for Deleuze as well, including in his work with Guattari, we take the situation we find ourselves in and employ what they call a higher taste for problems, for the conditions that made this situation possible, but that may well transform it and give rise to something new. Since a problematic field is inseparable from its solutions, a higher taste for the nature of problems will have a feel for problems that are inseparable from their solutions. And this in turn may have the effect of problematizing solutions that are forced solutions. That is, solutions that are forced upon us as solutions without a problem. As Deleuze makes clear, that's, that which is forced upon us can be very close to home. And a quote from Deleuze, the sorriest couples are those where the woman can't be preoccupied or tired without the man saying, what's wrong, say something or the man without the woman saying, and so on. Radio and television have spread the spirit everywhere and we're riddled with pointless talk, insane quantities of words and images. Stupidity is never blind or mute. So it's not a problem of getting expressed themselves, but providing little gaps of solitude and silence in which they might eventually find something to say. Repressive forces don't stop people expressing themselves, but rather force them to express themselves. What a relief to have nothing to say, the right to say nothing, because only then is there a chance of framing the rare and ever rare thing that might be worth saying. So now I kind of go into concluding here. I'll be done very soon, just a minute. Deleuze will offer similarly mundane examples in his postscript on control societies when he notes that if the stupidest TV game shows are so successful, 
It's because they're a perfect reflection of the way businesses are run. That is, businesses are constantly introducing an inexorable rivalry presented as healthy competition, a wonderful motivation that sets individuals against one another and sets itself up in each of them, dividing each within himself. I wonder what Deleuze would say about Squid Games and some of those other shows that are very popular these days. Uh, game shows take the rivalry between businesses, the compulsion and necessity to compete on the market that comes with capitalist laws of motion and presents them as fun, as something we ought to take up not only in our relations with, but even with ourselves. We take on this division within ourselves, for example, with the rivalry between our current self and the self that seeks improvement, the better self that will be the result of continuing education and continuous assessment. Deleuze closes this essay, however, with an important question and one that gets to the heart of his problematizing approach, noting that many young people have a strange craving to be motivated. They're always asking for special courses in continuing education, but he adds, it's their job to discover whose ends these serve, just as older people discovered with considerable difficulty who was benefiting from disciplines in Foucault's sense. In other words, those subjected to the disciplinary institutions Foucault discussed, factories, schools, prisons, came to recognize with considerable difficulty that it was not their ends being served and thus began to organize, unionize, and work towards different ends. So too now, since we have transitioned from a disciplinary society to a control society, Deleuze claims we have a similar need to discover through difficult questioning the ends that are being served. In closing, we can return to Hume and Bourdieu. Following Hume, for Deleuze and Guattari, a higher taste for problems does not follow a rule that one can readily use to determine whether or not board with taste. Rather, for Hume, taste entails seeing the consistence and uniformity of the whole. To develop taste, therefore, is to acquire the knack or feel for the consistence and uniformity that artworks deserving of praise have. In the same way, developing a taste for problems entails a knack or feel for the problematic consistency of elements that are inseparable from the solutions they make possible. At this point, another key difference between Bourdieu and Deleuze emerges. For whereas Bourdieu's feel for the game is a feel for the imminent demands of the game, the imminent rules and expectations of one's social situation, for Deleuze, such rules and expectations only arise with the solutions themselves. A solution, as Deleuze understands it, is a consequence of learning, with learning being, quote, the appropriate name for the subjective acts carried out when one is confronted with objecticity of a problem or idea. Successful learning for Deleuze entails a paradoxical period where the elements one encounters are brought to the consistency that is neither random, nor do they constitute the rules that come with knowledge or truth of a solution. A higher taste for problems is thus not as for Bourdieu, a feel for the imminent rules of the social field, but rather it is a taste for the conditions that may well undermine such rules and give rise to new rules, new habits, new expectations and ways of feeling and thinking. The difficult questioning that Deleuze would have us engage in is thus to question that which makes sense and do so to the point where it stops making sense. For instance, why do I ask my wife what's wrong? or ask her to tell me what is on her mind if she's more quiet Excuse than you. Me, Professor Bill, I'm so yeah. sorry to intrude, but we've run yeah. out of time. I'm extremely okay. sorry. Okay. It was such an interesting thing, but- okay. Yeah, it was on my last line, but that's okay. Yeah, please. No, no, please, please, you can conclude. No, okay, well, um, in an echo of Marx, the point for Deleuze in developing a higher taste for problems is not that we will come to a better understanding of the states of affairs we find ourselves in, but we may make it possible to change them. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bill. I mean, it was really interesting and engaging and well-structured and informative and uh, you applied, uh, you know, to the uh, practical political theory and explained us. I really enjoyed it. I'm afraid we won't be able to discuss, uh, but Matrola has uh, put in the chat box. I'll read uh, to you that. Okay. Um, she says, hi, interesting comparison of Boudou and Deleuze. How do you think the softening of capital with cultural or social effects or habits, according to Boudou, reduce the burden of incessant production to which capitalism is destined to its very limits or ends, according to Deleuze? Um, I mean, that's a good question. I think one of the, um, 
one of the big complaints about Bourdieu is that he does a very good job of analyzing and critiquing established institutions, but doesn't provide us with any tools to change and critique established social institutions. And I think thinking about capitalism in terms of uh, being a solution to a problem and with, with the notion of problematic fields gives us some of these tools um, to critique institutions in a way that Bourdieu doesn't allow us to do. At least that would be my argument. Thank you, Professor Bell, and thank you for your plenary. And uh, uh, we move on to non-plenary fourth. We stay in the same Zoom uh, meeting and we immediately, <laughs> I think, begin, right? I don't know I can. <laughs> uh, Manoj, are you there? Yeah. Please stay connected with us while we switch over. And in the meantime, I'll just play a video for you. Thank you very much. I uh, pronounce is the, the formation 